So I decided that I have to really change things a bit. So, you know, either change the rules or redefine the question. So I'm going to redefine the question. I'm definitely not here to teach, impart information, uh, do what most of the other people do here is like you know, say smart things. Um, instead, I really need to be here for almost the opposite reason. I need to take away. I need to get feedback. I need to get ideas for the way the News Challenge has been run, what it is, what we're doing, what our goals are, and some, some ideas for the future of either uh, better, other, whatever. But I'm definitely here for, for feedback. So please, I, I'm told I don't have, to, don't have to ask for questions, but I do want to make sure that, that you uh, do get out of this what you want to get out, and please make sure you ask questions. Okay, so let me give a quick history on what the News Challenge is and why we're doing it. Knight Foundation was founded in 1950. It was, it was a, a base it was from uh, newspaper publishers. And throughout those years, there was a belief in certain things that publishers did. Right or wrong, here's the belief. The belief is that a good publisher can help identify the community to itself. And a good publisher can help the community decide through information what is best, what should be focused on, and how to bring together the collective wisdom of the community. Information becomes the glue. Well, in a world where newspapers are losing circulation and losing advertising and not even getting young readers, what happens to this function? And Knight Foundation believes that it's a, it's a very critical function. And as actually, as we look at our programs over the past years, we've realized that there is, has emerged sort of unconsciously, a, a defining mantra of ours, which is serving the information needs of communities in a democracy. And ultimately, that's what the News Challenge is about. Ultimately, that's what many of our grants are about. The, this, this overall idea of what do communities need to function well, best, optimally in a democracy. That led us to focus the news challenge on geography and specific communities in a specific geographic area. First thing people said is this obviously shows you don't know what you're doing. You don't understand the web. The web is about virtual community. And here you are requiring us to create physical community in a specific geographic place. And our reply to that is, but you know what? I don't vote virtually. And I don't live in a virtual world even though I might attend one. I, my, you know, kids go to school districts that are defined by geography. We vote for House of Representative members defined by geography. We pay taxes defined by geography. Geography is indeed crucial to the way we function and crucial to the, the problems that we probably most easily can come together to solve. So therefore, the focus of the news challenge is on uh, digital news and information that's new and innovative, that can help build or bind community in a specific geographic area. And that's pretty much it. Those are the rules. And when in a, in a situation where there are so few, so few rules, each rule is, of course, critically important. Um, so again, it's, it's uh, digital innovation using news and information to build and bind community in a specific geographic area. So the challenge is not a newspaper preservation act. It is a new, we hope, a news organization, a news and information proliferation act and if newspapers and traditional organizations use the innovations that come out of it, great. We'll, we're happy about that. If they don't, others will. <coughs> but that's another of our concerns. If they don't, others will not only use them, but invent them. And we really hope that the people who are inventing the latest uh, digital information technologies care about things like 
ethics and principles and and freedom of speech and press and fairness and separation of advertising from from news and news from opinion these are vital to journalists and if journalists aren't involved in the creation of the tools that everybody's using and instead the tools are being created by technology companies that frankly don't understand don't know about or perhaps don't care about some of those things that just, it gives us pause so we're hoping that we can lead a lot of the, the news industry into the digital revolution to help them gather new audiences keep new audiences and and keep not only their perspective but their important position I mean if newspapers die that's one thing if the news and information function in a community dies that's a horribly different thing and that's something that we should I think work to make sure does not happen so let me give you a few examples of of grants that we made last year and sort of like why we did it and then I'll talk a little bit about what I'm seeing this year and then we'll go on from there so and I've just sort of informally grouped some of these grants and I don't know if anybody would agree and I don't even know if people at night would agree so it doesn't matter <laughs> so it's, they'll be watching your video yeah, they, they, they will find out later those clusters yeah, what were you just, thinking yeah. um, so some I would say some of the grants sort of fall around the idea of what do we hope to learn? And I would say one of those is MTV. MTV is, is putting 51 youth journalists in each state in the District of Columbia to report on the presidential election, particularly for mobile media, and to use mobile media for, for people who natively use mobile media in the first place. So in other words, to report on the media that young people are most comfortable using anyway. I don't know much about that. We don't know much about that. And we don't know much about that as conveying political information. Does it matter? Does it work? Is it effective? That's what we hope to find out. Um, MIT. The MIT grant is, is the, of course, the combination of the Media Lab and the Comparative Media Studies. And the idea there is to go into communities, study the needs, information needs of communities, and then, and I think this part is important not necessarily create products for them, although that's one aspect, but also to create new processes. There might be totally wonderful products there already that could be used differently. And so the processes they might create might enable greater information sharing among the community, greater, greater knowledge to, to uh, allow people to come together to decide community goals and, and aspirations. Arizona State is creating an incubator. Uh, uh, actually, it's, it's an entrepreneurial center. They, they have a digital innovation lab, and that digital innovation lab is now going to be sort of extended with a digital entrepreneurial lab. So they're going to try to take the ideas that come out of the innovation lab, pass them over to the entrepreneurial lab, and see if they can be turned into products. And also, they're going to take like students off the street who have an idea and want to create a product for community news and information and don't know how to go about it, they're going to help them through that process. And then similarly, there are seven universities that banded together to create a digital sort of incubator process. How to think about problems in new ways, how to, how to come up with uh, various solutions and then go out into the communities and test. Okay. Examples of where Knight Foundation is using these grants to, I hope, lead. And that would, one of those would be the Chi-Town Daily News, which is a, uh, a project in Chicago to put a reporter in, a citizen-trained, citizen-hired uh, reporter in each of Chicago's neighborhoods. If this works, there will be more coverage of Chicago than any of the newspapers even together are doing. I think there's something like 79 or 80 neighborhoods in Chicago, and the project is to hire a community organizer, find uh, and train citizen journalists, and then retain them is what our big goal is. How do you, how do you find them, train them, and retain them? Um, also, in, also in Chicago is uh, Adrian Holovati, who's doing a project called uh, Every Block. And the idea there ultimately is for people to be able to put in their address 
and find out everything occurring on that street in their block in the next block. So it might be something like, you know, one block over from you, there's a proposal to build a new school. Uh, on your street, the, the uh, uh, street cleaning schedule has been changed. Uh, block over, the street's going to be closed for a parade in two days. And in addition to that, will be uh, whatever people are blogging about and whatever is in the newspapers that, re that pertain to that geographic area. And then we've also, we gave three, three grants for games, all of which are, are looking at them differently, looking uh, at either how to do them differently or what they're doing differently. One is at Berkeley, one is at University of Minnesota, and one is the Gotham Gazette in, in New York. But the idea is, can you, you know, how do you use games to explain particularly ongoing stories, and can you create templates that newspapers would want to use because they would be easy enough to, in essence, write your own dialogue? Because obviously games take a long time to create and they're not necessarily designed for breaking news. They could be used for, for news that lasts a little longer, but it has to be easy for, the, for a newspaper, a news organization, to use it. So that's you know, one of the tests. Okay, examples of, I would say, how we hope to serve, how we hope to help uh, the, the profession uh, would be the Berkman's uh, Citizen Media Law Project on you know, gathering all the information of what's going on with citizen lawsuits in the various states, categorizing them, learning from them, and, and you know, getting a sense of <laughs> which state has a problem with XYZ, which one has a problem with ABC, and then also providing information for things like how to incorporate and, and uh, you know, important business decisions. So things that will help a lot of individuals because they will, they will now know what to think about, what to, uh, what to look for, and, and how best to proceed. Same thing with, with rising voices. The, the idea of micro-grants for uh, expanding storytelling capability, expanding citizen involvement uh, in areas throughout the world that don't have it. There, are you know, again, examples of where we're hoping to uh, serve the information needs of cultures that that need it, cultures we don't know about, cultures we need to, you know, we all need to bring into the fold. Village Soup is a, a, a grant that we're uh, ultimately we hope will create a. a a free uh, content management system for any citizen uh, that wants to start a newspaper and have a complete system and have advertising uh, figured into it and administration and you know it's like here's your newspaper box uh, you know load it up uh, and in, we're hoping it's easier to load than Drupal so <laughs> we'll find out. That's a joke that what goes over well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then another, uh, how we're hoping to serve is at Northwestern, where they're giving, uh, they're going to give nine uh, scholarships to computer science students to get a master's degree in journalism. And the idea is, of course, to, to get people who, first of all, are interested in that, and, and to bring them, uh, you know, into the world of journalistic problem solving. Uh, we, we have seen that people like Adrian have gone from journalism to the tech world and have used their journalistic background to create uh, new information telling, storytelling methods. Can we, uh, can we do the reverse? Can we take people with the skills already and teach them journal journalism's principles and ethics? We'll find out. Um, okay, that was last year. This year, we made several significant changes that I think related to the fact that we almost doubled our number of applications from 1,650 to 3,000. Uh, they're still being read. Uh, they're almost done. And we created different processes for, the, for this, uh, this whole thing. One is that you could, uh, when you submitted an application, you could decide whether you wanted it to be open or closed. If it were open, that would mean that your application would be visible on you know, for the world to see, but also to rate on a one to five star system and to vote on. I, I, I'm sorry, and to comment on. Now, let's say that you submitted, your, and the, the contest opened back in, in the summer, so let's say that you submitted an application and you got 18 comments. We then allow you to take what you think are the best ones of those 
and rewrite your application incorporating those comments and resubmit. So we're truly trying to say we want to enable the wisdom of the crowd, but we don't want it enabled just so that people can look at it and go, gosh, aren't those commenters smart? Uh, we would like it to go a step farther. Aren't those commenters smart and, oh, they helped improve that application. It is now much better. Or you could choose to close drought as, as traditionally most people did before. Uh, we advertised in 10 languages. We, uh, and as part of that, uh, we worked with both a public relations firm, but it, we also worked with MTV and MTV International. And the, the way we got to work with MTV was that we created uh, a, an award we called the Young Creators Award. And we set aside $500,000 of the $5 million in new money that we plan to give away to uh, award specifically to people who are 25 years old and younger. And we, you know, we, with, that certainly ties into MTV's interest. And they helped us advertise it both uh, through, we, they did PSAs, we did PSAs on the website and on television on MTV uh, for uh, various concerts that they had. And then also we hooked up with MTV International and they started advertising it on various, their pages in Hong Kong, which is I think the largest MTV International site. The, the news challenge was on the homepage. Uh, same thing in Latin America. So our MTV connection I think helped us immensely both in getting young people where we went from probably a handful last year to 356 this year um, and half of those are international. So I thought that was also you know pretty good in terms of goals because we wanted to extend this contest internationally. We, we, we know what we don't know which is why we're doing this contest and why it has so few rules uh, and we also know that that there are a lot of people doing things in other countries that we should be doing and could be doing and haven't quite migrated over here yet and there are ideas that we want, want to tap into. Um, so you might wonder, what are we seeing this year? First, the disappointments. The dis disappointments are that what we're seeing is people not really understanding what we mean and therefore probably us not explaining well enough what we mean by innovative. People tended to look at last year's winners or look at what is and apply it to a new delightful wonderful helpful sweet kind content area that just made us cry when we rejected it because it it would you know we have stopped giving money to AIDS orphans like 19 times in this contest. Uh, and it's, it, again, it's a, it's a great content area, but the way that people were proposing it, I want to create a website for AIDS orphans. Well, those websites are there and you can probably don't need our money to do it. Um, so one issue with the contest this year is that people took what is and applied it to a new content area, and because it was a new content area, they thought, that it would be a good application. Our definition of innovation is, you know, squishy, sort of like the definition of, of pornography in the sense that you know it when you see it. And ours was sort of the same way. If we've seen it already, okay, it's not innovative. If we can easily imagine it, we pretty much assumed it's not innovative. Um, and if it was a winner last year, it's definitely not innovative this year, by definition. And people really did not, I think, understand that, and we need that'll be a, an area for us to work much harder explaining next year. Um, the types of, of things that we are seeing are uh, applications for Facebook, um, much more use of, of uh, global positioning devices and, and information technology, uh, much more use of of uh, sort of place tagging, not for wireless. So you know, if I'm walking, if I'm walking by, if I'm walking uh, uh, on a tour, and I go past a certain building, and I've I've got my either my phone or whatever wireless device set up right, uh, it will tell me what the history of this building as I, as I pass it. Uh, so 
various uses of that sort of technology are, are certain things, the types of things that we're seeing now. A lot of people wanted to do training for X, Y, and Z, and that's not really where this contest is, is heading necessarily. So, because of the changes, what are some of the problems that we've had? One is that we wanted to reach out internationally. Last year, there were 15% of the applicants were international. This year, there were 40% were international. So the outreach really worked. But did we, did we defeat ourselves because we decided that the standard is an absolute standard? So we still believe that innovation is innovation and it has to reach an absolute standard as opposed to what is innovative in a given country. An individual told me what's innovative in Afghanistan is television. Well, that's, you know, that's not what we're going to give a grant for. Um, so we decided that we would, we would go for the, the absolute standard, but that is obviously going to cut out a lot of our international applicants, and we're just crossing our fingers that it doesn't count, you know, cut out a whole lot. Now, we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, it's also very difficult now with the Patriot Act to make grants internationally to individuals. And we have to figure out ways to do that or individuals to work through. Or, and then they have a lot of paperwork that they have to fill out and IRS stuff and all this, you know, where they have to certify that they're not, not a terrorist organization and all of that. And, you know, so what if we give a grant to a guy in Bolivia who doesn't have the, the um, means to deal with the paperwork? So how do we provide that? How, you know, we haven't quite thought that through yet. Um, and then how do we monitor it? How do we monitor a grant in, in China and another one in Bolivia and, and you know, another one in, in Uzbekistan? You'd be traveling even more than you have. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so that also, the, this whole open-close thing, I mean, I can imagine that it could create intellectual property issues. We, of course, tried to avoid that by saying uh, and, and forcing people to, you know, go through the, the disclosure thing that, that says, um, if, if you comment on any of these applications, you are doing so only to improve the applicant's application and to improve the individual's application. You are not doing so to create any intellectual property claim on your own. You're doing so specifically to help improve this application. You know, if you can accept that, then go ahead. Um, are lawyers comfortable with that? I you know, can still imagine that if, if uh, an application that was revised because of several comments, ends up being awarded a million dollars, there could be issues. We're just waiting. Um, young creators, I would love you know, to, to give a, a, an award to a 16-year-old. Uh, and actually, one of them wrote to me and said, my parents are divorced. I live with my dad. But I don't like him, and I would not want him to get the money. I want my mom to get it. And we're like, oh my. <laughs> I guess we haven't thought this all through yet. So, you know, those are the, those are the sorts of issues that we have created our, for ourselves this year. Intellectual property, dealing with young people, making grants internationally. And those are the sorts of things for which I'm seeking feedback. So, it's your turn. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, so I, I have to say, first and foremost, um, I'm thrilled to hear that the international outreach has gone as well as it did. Um, as happy as we were to be recognized uh, with a grant last year, we um, said some snarky things about the fact that we were the only international grantee, and uh, as someone based at yeah, I knew University, that. I'm, I heard that. Yeah. No, I, I, I believe in being very honest about these things. Um, but it's really useful to hear those concerns about how you support an international grant. So where my question was sort of going on this is, to what extent are other funders looking at what you're doing with this challenge? And do you have funders who are deep in the former Soviet Union, for instance, saying, hey, can we work with you on this and do a former Soviet Union news challenge? Or can we learn from your model and do something in an area where we have the geographic expertise, the capacity to monitor, but we can do stuff that's innovative for this local environment rather than necessarily internationally innovative? I think that is 
a great way to go that we have not gone yet. Uh, what we've done so far is try to work with international organizations that we know, and that typically those are ones that are based in the U.S. and then extend beyond. But we, and, and our foundation itself is getting more and more into international work, but we're not heavily known for it like Ford or Rockefeller, and we're, that's an, a growth area for us. Um, we, so th therefore, we don't know who might be good to work with in Russia. Yeah. Um, we, those are things we need to find out. I think it would be a good way to do it. The way we thought of it so far is we've given grants to Internews, and we've given grants to the World Association of Newspapers, and to International Center for Journalists, and they have programs throughout the world. And they might be some of our monitoring aid assistance or valuation assistance or, uh, you know, even administration. I, I just I, I have the strong suspicion that if you sat down with Open Society Institute mm -hmm. and sort of said let's co-fund something for the former Soviet Union, so that you get. Board member or not? I, 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 I'm not saying that in my board capacity. That is my portfolio over there actually, because um, I do software over there rather than media. But um, I, I suspect that there's a number of places where there might be that traction. I think it's a really useful acknowledgement that it's hard to fund where you don't have boots on the ground to monitor. Yeah. But I also think there's the danger of sort of sending the message that all the innovation in this space happens in the U.S., which we all know not to be true. Yeah, and, and we, we, we definitely do not want to send that message. Um, whether or not we're going to be successful with that this round, I don't know, because as you know, we really didn't give any international grants last year. I mean, I wouldn't count yours as international, really, in, in the sense that it's, you know, you're based here, and it's, I can monitor a lot easier by talking with you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave. So Gary, one of the benefits that's uh, accrued to, to my project is the networking we've done with other News Challenge winners. Mm -hmm. And first of all, is that something that Knight anticipated was going to happen, that there was going to be this sort of tight camaraderie amongst the winners. And second, is there a way to further develop that and make it even more of a positive for this next group? Actually, we expected just the opposite. I thought that we would have such, you know, big egos in the room of people who've just been given, you know, three hundred thousand dollars. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's always yeah. a lawyer. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, oh my God, we got to deal with this. <laughs> and you know, I, you know, give a million dollars to a twenty-five-year-old kid, he might think that he's really something. Um, and so I, I anticipated a lot of ego problems in the room, and it was just the opposite. The, the group melded and meshed and, and got along and supported each other, and it, it was absolutely delightful to see. Uh, so obviously, we, we will do everything we can to continue that and support that, and we've gotten the groups together a couple times now, and, and then of course the next year's winners or the first year's winners will start be folded together. and So we're going to keep doing all that because we, in Toronto in October, um, we got all the winners together, and they sat around a table, a room like this, sort of in a horseshoe, and they all went around and explained their projects, what they were doing, where they, where they are with it. And by the end of that, you were thinking, I was thinking, holy criminy, there's the future right there. The future of the news and innovation industry is sitting in this room. And anybody, any of the people at this conference who are not paying attention to this are really missing out. And the other thing I thought was that by accident, a lot of these projects tie together. <coughs> and it almost looks as if there was a grand intent to create an Uber project. There isn't, but I, I can see that, that you know, projects will meld together and work with, work with one another, which I think is fantastic and another you know, uh, benefit of this. <clears throat> for the open closed application process, how many people applied through the open mm -hmm. process and how many comments did they get? Did they use them effectively? I don't know about the using them part right now. 40% of the applicants used the open process. Hmm. Wow. Um, and yeah, which I thought was, you know, act, yeah, I thought that was pretty, pretty good. Um, and there was an average of two comments per application. Some had many more, many had zero. Um, 
and some people did indeed resubmit. It was a, it was a huge, huge minority, sounds wrong to say, but uh, very few people did resubmit, but some did, based on the comments. But the overall, the average was two comments per application, and 40% of the applicants were, were in the open route. Yes? Um, did you advertise that open process in any way other than people who were already applying would know that they can comment on other entries? Like, for instance, was there any way that the public could find out about this and then go in and, and comment on the entries? We didn't advertise the open process, per se. We just advertised the contest. And then once you got to the contest page, you could read about it. I, I literally didn't know about it, despite mm -hmm. writing several blog posts pushing people towards the contest. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that commenting on applications that was in there, I don't know to what extent it would have motivated me to do it other than to you know, sort of give props to the ones that I was already aware of. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think it was widely, widely known. Yeah. That or I've been deleting a lot of too much email lately. Which is <laughs> <all> <laughs> awesome. And how are you going to evaluate whether that was successful and whether you'll do it again. Um, we're year. going to sort of backtrack with the, the winners. And, and after we the winners have been selected, then we're going to ask them, uh, number one, what process did they use? And, and did they get comments? And did they use them? So we'll, we'll sort of do you know an investigation after we've selected the winners. So you, you don't know <laughs> how people applied? I mean, I, I, I know. In, I mean, I know. I can go and find any individual application as to whether it was open or closed. Yes, um, but by the time the applications get to the final set of reviewers, they won't have that information. I mean, they're all going to be pushed together. Yes, Colin. Can I go back to the Uber project um, and the sort of some of the original goals of, of the challenge and ask? Uh, how you're going about trying to get some of these ideas, these innovations connected with the existing newspaper or, or kind of mainstream media, traditional media, whether there's, so, if you think about kind of investing in a startup, if you're trying to help them to kind of move up the chain or get these values instilled in them, instill their technological and innovativeness in other organizations. First, let me take how are we trying to, to get the information out to, say, traditional media. And that two ways, well, one main way is that we, we, go to their, we go to the conferences and we bring the winners to, like, the editor and publisher interactive media conference. It's a bunch of uh, publishers from newspapers across the country. And so all, all of the News Challenge winners are there to introduce their projects and talk about them and do a panel and, and discuss it. So. That's one public sense in, in, way in which we're doing it. The other thing we've done is we just started a blog called Idea Lab, and it's on PBS. And it's um, it's uh, it, uh, Mark Glazer is the host of the PBS Media Shift blog. He is now also the host of our Idea Lab blog, which is part of the PBS Media Shift blog. It's sort of a separate section of it. And the idea there is to do a couple things show the problems that everybody are trying to solve and the problems they're having when solving these and how do they overcome them. But then also let the world know this is, this is what's coming, this is what's being worked on, these are the projects. And uh, whether that means seek public input or whatever, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. Um, tomorrow on the Idea Lab blog and a couple others will be announced a project that is going to involve uh, 12, 12 newspapers. And it's springing from uh, the work that one of our News Challenge grantees is doing. And it's going to be tested you know, in the waters of 12 different newspapers and announced tomorrow. And will be very, very hot. Max in the back. <clears throat> is, if, if you look at the, the open application process as like a good thing that you want to, you know, you want to encourage and move up 40%, have you considered incentivizing people who apply open by either you know increasing the possible cap of the grant they could receive if you apply open, or I mean, it would probably not be a good idea to say you know you're more likely to get a grant if you apply <clears throat> in the open process, but something to incentivize it. Actually, I'd, I'd like to talk about that a little bit because we took the op we took the opposite route uh, in the sense that what we decided to to make to tell people was we didn't want to punish you no matter which way you applied, that whatever, if you have a good idea and you want to keep it 
quiet and you think it's already good and you've vetted it out and you don't want you're worried about someone stealing your idea um, fine and if you you're not sure about your idea and you want public input fine and we didn't want people to think that depending on which category they entered they had a better chance of winning um, we also had uh, internally, frankly, a lot of arguments about this. Uh, as an administrator of the contest, I was freaking out about it because I was, now, again, the whole intellectual property thing was, was scaring me. I was afraid that what's going to happen is somebody is going to read an application in the open category and then apply in the closed category. And that individual, you know, the, the person who submitted the idea in the open category, let's say that you know the other person two modifies it a little bit and submits in the closed category, person one will never know. And neither would I, probably. So you know it, it, those sorts of things were, were scaring me in terms of how to administer a contest fairly. So I think the best thing we can probably do next year is to publicize better the fact that there are advantages, we, and we did try to say this, that there are advantages to, to submitting an open application. And the advantages are this. You think you've got a great idea, but you don't understand the whole community, physical community geography, geography requirement. Well, perhaps others can you know, volunteer to test it in their community or step up and make your, your, make your proposal more whole, more complete. So you can get a better proposal if you are, if you have any questions about it, it's possible to use the open process to strengthen your proposal. Um, and that's, that's about as far as we went with it. Inviting economist to Max uh, first, I was going to raise the question that, given that your talk is already posted on the Media Shift blog, are bloggers, in fact, too fast and <laughs> not accurately <laughs> giving time to defend and, and, and digest before? Uh, I'm just jealous that you got to post up before I did. Um, <laughs> the question <laughs> about waiting to hit publish to wait to see what you say. I, 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 have, I have too much to digest here. Um, so you got 1,600 last year. You got 3,000 this year. I'm wondering if the curve continues ever upwards, or whether at a certain point the well starts to run a little dry. Um, and I, I'm sort of curious, um, basically, how many years you think this particular model of open solicitation will work? Is there probably sort of a finite number of interesting, innovative, journalistic ideas that are going to come up in the first couple of years, and then we're going to sort of work through the consequences of them? Or do you think that there's sort of a constant level of innovation that you'll see coming up year to year? My guess is that we will see a constant level of innovation. And the reason I say that is only because of looking, looking backward. So some of you were probably doing this, uh, were I'm sure doing this long before me, but I, I started in digital media in uh, 1995. So. One of the fun things about doing digital media then was the fact that there, there was no right way to do things. Uh, there was no right way to create a website. There was no right way to do news online. There was no right way to do communities or, or comments on stories or anything. And every year there's like there's a new technology, there's a new process, and that just complicates the fact that there's, again, no right way to use that process. And I think that we've seen that every year. There's been a new this, a new that. Whether it's whether it's YouTube or MySpace or whatever, or, or whether it's whether it's uh, RSS feeds or other tools, there's still in many ways no right way to use them, or there's no right way to use them for this new process in which we've decided to try to use them. So I think that so far um, we can main, we can maintain our we can sustain this. Um, but I should tell you that that our goal is to just sustain it until it dies out. I mean, if it, if it continues to be interesting, if we continue to get applications, if they continue to be cool, we'll continue to do it. At least we'll continue to go back to the board. We've been authorized for five years. And, and we are, you know, we don't consider five years to be magical. Uh, if, if next year we got 100 applications and they were all bad, you know, we'd probably end it. Uh, but if it, if it keeps going, uh, we're certainly willing to, to keep it going because I would say it's tying in again with this overall goal of ours, the information needs of communities in, in a democracy. And, I, and I, I, I need to mention that along that line, Knight Foundation is having a conference in February for specifically that purpose of bringing together community foundations 
to say, you know what, although you've always been worried about things like after daycare and health centers and all that, you really ought to also be worried about information in your community. Because number one, a lot of communities are losing it, or they never had it. And without it, how can we decide what our priorities are in the first place? How can we decide whether we need or want that daycare center or where it should be if we don't have a healthy information structure in this community? So com you community foundations, we are going to challenge them and say, you have a new area that you just simply have to get into. And that is information, protecting it, guaranteeing it, supporting it. And John had a question. I just wanted to um, follow on this theme of democracy. Mm -hmm. First off, just as, um, as I think you know, most of us around this table, um, need to rely on foundations like yours to sustain ourselves. The Harvard Law School, for instance, doesn't support the Berkman Center. We pay rent for this facility and all the food and so forth. So um, it's extremely wonderful that you've not only made grants, of course, here, but also that you're willing to share with us the process by which you go through to conceive it. I'm not sure I've ever seen a senior program officer in public stand up and say, this is how we do it. So bravo to you guys for this. Not on the record, at least. Not on the record, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to out you, Ethan. <laughs> not exactly a program officer. But anyway, thank you for doing this. I suspect others will be playing this podcast for some time to try to figure out how you how you think about it. But um, going to the, the goals of what you're trying to do, as you're reviewing thousands of applications, um, you've now a couple of times said this relationship between information provision and democracies. Um, the other day in the Berkman Center, we were whiteboarding here our efforts in the area of internet and democracy. This is something near and dear to what we're trying to do. Obviously, one big chunk of it is the um, services and media field with CMLP and Globe Voices and others in there. Um, but I wondered if you could talk through um, sort of two aspects of it. One is, what do you think that relationship is about? So what is it that you're trying to fund that might be, is it more information is better for democracy because X, Y, Z, or is, is that path well laid out? Um, and the second would be, um, as you go internationally, when you say something like, we want to um, use this, these tools to improve democracies, is it that you're aiming for a certain kind of democracy in which you hope it to uh, be evolving, or are you quite happy to give a grant to an authoritarian regime which is not democratic at all, but where you're trying to instill democratic values? Um, so the second one really being, are you willing to make grants in non-democracies with the hope that they will become more democratic through your these processes, whatever they may be? Okay. Let me answer that one right away. Yes, we are. Huh? We're willing to make grants in non-democracies. And, and let me just use as an example of that the, the uh, State Department in, in Tunisia. And the only reason I have this example is because I was there, and that's the only one I know. Uh, they, they, uh, for World Press Freedom Day about two years ago, three years ago, they Tunisia has one of the most repressive press systems in the world, and is rated, you know, I think almost as bad or worse than the Soviet Union was when it was a Soviet Union. And the the ambassador there decided that the way to help support information flow is to try to support the online editors. And so the embassy decided for World Press Freedom Day. They would give online editors cover by inviting them all to the ambassador to, to a, a conference hosted by the ambassador uh, to talk about press freedom. And they came. Mm -hmm. And then as part of that conference, I conducted a seminar on uh, economic sustainability of online news operations. And the embassy, the reason they did this was because they, they see it as the, nose, the proverbial nose through the camel, camel's nose through the tent. Of the beginning of the, you know creating cracks in a in an authoritarian regime that can do nothing but help eventually the information flow in the, in the country. So even the U.S. government is of course supporting not, you know information flow in non democracies. Uh -huh. So, so including through the Berkman Center. Yeah. So to be yeah. clear, anyway. Yeah. 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 So yes. Yeah, uh -huh. So we would we would support that. Yep. And uh, then the other question concerning what is. What's, so there's a lot of theoretical debate, there are empirical debates about why does more information or whatever it is that you're after here result in stronger democracies? What is the process by which you go from the first statement, more information on the web is better, to democracies are stronger? Or in fact, mm -hmm. um, do you guys have one sense of what that line is like? Do you, are you just engaging in the debate because you think it's a hypothesis, or what's the kind of what's in between those? Two I would say I would say the background of it is you know most of most of the people who, in senior management at the Knight Foundation are, came up through journalism. In that role, they came up through the ideas of of Milton and Mills, and the idea of uh, there is a kernel of truth out there somewhere, and more information is better than less information, and, and 
that uh, the best way to combat bad speech is more speech. <coughs> and those are sort of ingrained in us. So take that. Right, traditional as, Western as, view. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh -huh. So take that as a springboard. Yeah. And then I, I would say, I guess, we, we, we are also willing to say that we don't know that more information is better for a community. Uh, we don't know that there's a relationship between more information and quality information or useful information. So we're actually going to create a commission. Um, we're going to study. Uh, we're going to create a study on the information needs of communities. And we have one sort of underway right now as funded by the, uh, us and the Pew Center. University of Missouri is studying 51 communities. They're doing a scan of the, uh, the media, all media in 51 communities uh, over a three-year period. And uh, it's going, going to look at communities that have a lot of citizen-generated media. Do they have higher level, levels of civic engagement and, and participation? Uh, communities that have traditional media and the, the online sites of traditional media, how do the two compare or not compare? Are there, are there things we can learn from them? So we're in the, we're in the beginning processes of studying the information that exists in communities is a relationship to civic participation. Our assumption is probably that we want there to be. I don't know that there, you know, is. We're going to try to find out. Uh, we're also we will be will be we will be doing more to study of the information needs of communities and democracies, um, and and go from there. I mean, we're we're hoping that research that will be done in the next, say, two three years, will inform more of our grant making. But right now, it seems to be funneled around the, the idea of information needs of a community and democracy. I think we're willing to say, at least, democracies function best with information. Right. And it seems like a state, safe yeah, statement. That, right? you know, that, that one, that one other foundations can go ahead and quote, and I'll still be OK. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, from there, we're going to see. That's great. Sorry, that's an incredibly hard question, but. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, you said that you're going to get all these community foundations together and talk to them about how they have to get involved in community you know, in, in information um, for the reasons that you guys are just talking about. Um, when you go talk to them, are you talking to them about um, funding community and, and citizen journalism efforts in their communities? Or are you talking to them about um, ways for the organizations that they are already funding to become publishers and um, uh, content producers and more uh, product and uh, content producers mm -hmm. themselves because I think there's a I think I tend to think that the the latter is sort of more what's happening in these communities um, uh, on its own mm -hmm. well part of the idea for this came from the Berkman Center uh, fellow Dan Gilmore who gave a, a, a who wrote a column in the San Francisco Chronicle, I believe, about uh, two months ago or so, and he basically said this idea: community foundations need to get involved in in communities and information. And he, in his column, wrote suggestions like um, perhaps they need to fund a local blogger, perhaps they need to create a fellowship for investigative reporting at the at the newspaper, perhaps, you know. But they need to do something to help maintain, as, as newspapers cut back in investigative reporting, for example, because it's expensive, should a community foundation uh, fund it, you know, create a, an investigative reporting fund and, you know, things of this nature. So that's where the idea came from. We read this. We loved the idea. Our president of our foundation, like, hit on it immediate and immediately and said, this is it. This is what we need to do. We need to support information and communities in this way. He loved the column. He gave a speech a couple days later at the community foundation conference, and he challenged everybody to, to start doing this. Um, we don't have a set way in mind. What we want to do is change a mindset first. Yeah. Uh, information covers a pretty broad territory. So um, do you have a preference for uh, um, particular types of information that you fund? Um, is it uh, um, uh, statistical information about what's going on? In the, uh, and over at the far left and or right of the spectrum, there are people who are writing opinions and, well, right in the middle, I guess, there's op-eds and reflecting on information. And then it's 
goes all the way out to people talking about what matters to them, which might not be easily characterized as information, but it may have something to do with democracy and may have something to do with journalism. So do you have a, a, an, um, a set idea of what is the sort of information that you're most interested in um, helping people find, promulgate, and share? Which section of the newspaper would you rather fund? Is it the front yeah. page, the op-eds, yeah. the, the, the uh, uh, entertainment? Lifestyle. No, I don't, lifestyle. I don't think exactly. it's, I mean, if we had, if, if, to answer that question, we would fund the local section. We would fund the local reporting. Um, but that's, you know, that's not what we're going to do. Um, and the only reason I say that is, is that, you know, we, we are trying to support the, the information flow, you know, on a local level, in specific geographies. I mean, that's, that's the, been our focus for the past two or three years now. Uh, we're not looking to fund, you know, we're not looking to fund bloggers. Um, we're not looking to fund, uh, in, in this project, we're, we're not looking to fund uh, editorial cartoonists. It, it's nothing like that. We're, we're looking to create an awareness in communities that newspapers are changing. With them, some important roles that they performed might also be changing. Wake up and smell the roses, and if, and and you should be trying to do something about this. And as far as I think we're willing to go is to encourage people to do something about this, but not to tell them where or how. Yes. Um, I had my interest peaked last week in a meeting here about um, the reflective process of First, you get the information, and then um, is your decision making enhanced in any way by the process that happens when you kind of look, talk about the information, and, and reflect on it, and and then go ahead and make a decision? And um, this, so this is sort of piggybacking on John's question a little bit of, do you see is there? Is there a line between the, the reflective process and the way that, that information is processed that, that also goes towards democracy? Or are you looking sort of just at the information coming in and the best way to get information about? Well, first of all, I have to ask, did you have your information peaked this week? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what she'll be saying next week. Back when Gary Keppel was here. I don't think we've thought it through that carefully, to be honest with you. But uh, I would say again, we're not trying to be proscriptive here. We're we're trying to to say that for us, the Knight Foundation thinks that information is important for the healthy life of communities. Now, is it important because you should take that information in in a linear way and do something with it, or is it important because you should reprocess it and think about it and and spit it out differently. You know, I think they're both great. Uh, and I don't, again, if, if it improves the life of a community, I, I don't think we care. You talk about Could you Oh, sorry. My name, is, my name is Lisa Williams. I'm a Knight grantee uh, for the project called Grateful. Um, Gary, you talk about um, information being important for the life of communities. Um, do you care about how that's? Um, sent out. How do you feel about the survival of the current journalistic institutions, big news organizations? Because that seems like that's where the big crack up is. Um, okay. Again, one of the things I said in starting this was that the Night News Challenge is not a newspaper preservation act. Okay. And now I would say it is a news and information preservation act. But it's not a newspaper preservation act, and we personally are not hung up on the form of the information. We're hung up on the, you know, the fact that it's there or not there, and the quality of the people doing it. The, it's interesting to me because the high tech industry went through a very similar crack up during the mid '80s when all of our big institutions imploded. Deck, IGN, HP, they all laid off people by the thousands. And there were a lot of op-ed pieces I went back and looked of how will America stay on the cutting edge of technology? Our entire nation will fall behind, kind of like the op-ed pieces you sit here today about, well, if we don't have a newspaper, just we should throw in the towel on democracy. 
And of course, that, that didn't happen. You know, what, what happened was those institutions died, but people, but the but technology. The functions were diffused. Right. And I think that that will happen again. Right. Um, you know, the, the function of information deep imparting or information dissemination is certainly diffused now from what it was and will continue to be more so. Uh, the the one-to-many model is pretty much dead, and the many-to-many -many is is alive and well. And, and uh, I think you know back to the back to the whole libertarian theory of the press. I think information will seek its way out. In that case, the compost pile turns out to be pretty important. It might actually again? be the compost pile turns out to be pretty important. Then, in which case, it might actually be more important to allow people to opt in to let their proposals be public after the judging, even if they've lost. Because maybe the maybe ideas just need to percolate. Yeah, I, now, th actually, that's another good point. That's ready. something we have not done, is make the applications, winning or losing, uh, available publicly. I think part of it is just because we, we, you know, we would have to get permission from every individual to do right. so, and we haven't haven't created a process to do that. and and. I, I suspect that it would be helpful for people to, fu to read both winning and losing applications. But the flip side of that is, when it gets down to the final 200 out of 3,000, it turns into art, not science. I mean, let's be real. The, it, it's real easy to cut out 50% of the applications because they don't meet the minimum criteria. But from that point on, it gets progressively, I would say, geometrically more and more difficult to pick winners until you get down to the final whatever number. And then they're all good. You know, they're just all good. Even though they're not useful to you, they might be useful to somebody. You can't tell who they'll be useful to, even the ones that you reject right out of hand. Mm -hmm. might be good for somebody else. I agree. I, I think maybe just to, to build on that, um, within Rising Voices, a, a lot of what we're doing is regranting. Essentially, there's a pool of money that we're able to give in quite small grants between about $2,000 and $5,000 to applicants from developing nations. And we had 30x as many as we could fund in sort of the first round of that contest. One of the things that David Sasaki, who's actually running that project, did that has turned out to be brilliant is to encourage everybody to participate in a community with one another to discuss what they were talking about in their grant, maybe why it didn't work, maybe why it did work. Um, and that's actually proved to be a very effective community because the truth is most of the people who are putting yeah. forth these ideas are going to try to get them off the ground whether or not we give them $5,000 or not. Right. Um, and so what they're really looking for is the sort of support of that yeah. wider community. One of the things that's interesting is that while there have been some really interesting synergies in the people who've received the challenge grants, I actually think right. in many cases you could have more synergies for the people who didn't receive them, mm -hmm. or between people who received right. them and didn't receive them who might you know, end up doing some sort of coaching or some information sharing. I think sharing. that's tremendously important. I think that institutions used to provide that little pool of people you could talk to, and it's those things that are gone. Those kind of communities have been very, very influential to me. Another way that we need to improve what we're doing, and, and I think this is one of them that you've just suggested, but another way is, in essence, how do, how do we create a second life for some of these applications? And by that, I mean... No, there are not the three-dimensional world, we hope, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, not, in, not in that, no, <laughs> that's not what I meant. Um, the, a lot of journalism foundations have told us that they would love to have you know, if we, if we granted 25 uh, grants for the News Challenge, they would love to fund number 26, you know, they, and 27 and 28. That's one thing. So how do we get that to them? And the other is um, a lot of these, the international ones, uh, organizations like the International Center for Journalists or World Association of <coughs> Newspapers would want to work with some of these, these applicants. So uh, a big challenge for us in the coming year is how do we, how do we take this, this treasure trove that we have of 3,000 applications and help more of them than just the ones that we're going to give money to. That's good. I didn't even notice that, but we are about five minutes longer than we ordinarily go. But this is a great, um, great continuation past the, the usual mark. So I think we should probably do a little um, thank you and hard stop mm -hmm. to release people. I suspect the conversation will, will keep going. But Gary, thank you so okay. much. For thank you. Thank you.